Exodus chapter 33 and beginning of chapter 34. Uh, before I read, I would just remind you that what we are about to read is nothing less than the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. And so we approach this with a sense of gravity. Exodus 33, beginning in verse 1, Yahweh said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. And no one put on his ornaments. For Yahweh had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. Now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onwards. Now Moses used to take the tent. And pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought Yahweh would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and Yahweh would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door." Thus, Yahweh used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to Yahweh, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and have also and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And Yahweh said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. For man shall not see me and live. And Yahweh said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Yahweh said to Moses, 
cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by morning and come up to the mountain to come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain, that no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as Yahweh had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Let's pray. Father, we pray now that as we walk through these amazing verses that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit and that our hearts would be made soft and that our minds would be open and that we would be changed as we encounter you through your word. We pray this for the glory and in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, a year ago, a year and two weeks ago, On the second Sunday of September in 2021, uh, our family was actually up north on the San Juan Islands. My wife, Cammie, was participating in her first half marathon. And since this was her first race, the preparations that went into it were pretty significant. She had researched, she had trained, she had special gear, special food for that morning. She was ready for her race, and and so were we. The the kids and I hadn't gone with her to the starting line because it was way too early in the morning. It wouldn't have made any sense. But our plan was to be there when she crossed the finish line so we could celebrate her. So we knew about when the race started, and we had a really good sense of what her, her pace was. So we had set a good time for us to arrive back at the finish line so that when she crossed it, we could take pictures and videos and celebrate with her, her accomplishment. In the interim, while she was running, we decided that we would go explore the island. And so we went on a beautiful walk. We found this wonderfully secluded beach with tons of interesting driftwood. And when the time was right, we trekked back up to our car and started driving toward the finish line. There's one problem. Because of where we were hiking, I didn't have any cell phone service. So I didn't get the update text from Cammie telling me that she was three miles away, two miles away, one mile away. Apparently, the adrenaline of actually being in a race had increased her pace significantly. She had been running faster than she ever ran during her training. And so, when we finally pulled into the parking lot and got to the finish line, we saw Cammy already done with the race. And the kids were devastated. The whole point of us being there was to cheer Mama on as she crossed the finish line, and we had missed it. It's a question for you this morning. Has something like this ever happened to you? You say to your kids 
your grandkids or close friend, I'm going to be there. I promise. Basketball game, dance performance, piano recital, and whatever the reason, right, getting caught in traffic or something coming up at work keeping you late or the worst, completely forgetting about it. That's never happened to any of us, right? You miss it. What happens when you do show up? Right? The looks of devastation on their precious faces is heartbreaking, isn't it? Right? You promise to be there on that special day, for that special moment, and for whatever reason, you couldn't keep your promise. As we come to our text this morning, it's easy to think that the center of our text is God's glorious revelation of his name in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. Right? Yahweh passes before Moses and he proclaims his name. He, he exposits his name. And what we see in those verses are stunning. But that's not the center of the text. See, when we work through the text, we see that God's revelation of his name to Moses is merely a divine act that affirms to Moses and to the people of Israel what is the driving question of the passage, which is this. Will God's presence be withheld from his people or will he go with his people as they leave Sinai and move toward the promised land? That's the central question of the text. That's the point of our passage. Or as my kids said a little over a year ago, that was the whole point of us coming so we could be with Mama when she finished the race. And that's the question of this text. Will God be with his people or not? Which brings us to the main point that I want you to walk out of this auditorium with this morning. The main point that I want to resonate in your souls this morning. God's people should crave his presence more than anything in the universe. God's people, it's you and me, church, we should crave his presence more than anything in the universe. Let's begin with our first point this morning. You can find it in your bulletin insert or you can follow along on the screen. God's presence withheld. God's presence withheld. A threat. I alluded to this last Sunday, but look at verse 1 of Exodus 33. God tells Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we have gotten past the fiasco of idolatry, and now God is telling Moses to lead the people into the promised land. We read this in the next verse. Verse 2, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So if we were just to pause right there, we would realize we've come a pretty long way. Because in Exodus 32, right, God was threatening to completely and entirely consume the nation of Israel. But we've moved past that. And here he is indicating that he's actually going to keep his promise to Abraham, to the patriarchs, and he's going to safely deliver the people into the land of promise. We've come a long way. But something's not right. Notice first what God says back in verse 1 to Moses. He says to Moses, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. It's intentional. Back in Exodus 32, verse 7, God says to Moses in his anger at the people, go down for your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt. And notice how Moses replies in verse 11. 
O Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land? See what Moses and Yahweh are doing there? They're playing hot potato. Okay? That's our first indication that something is still amiss. Our second indication, the hammer, if you will, comes in chapter 33, verse 3. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you. What is Yahweh saying there to Moses? I'm going to give you the promised land, but my presence will not accompany you. Notice how the people respond in verse 4. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. To inherit the promised land, to have all their enemies expelled from the land, to, to occupy that prime place of real estate, flowing with milk and honey. And that little phrase, flowing with milk and honey, is supposed to remind us of the Garden of Eden. <laughs> to have all of that, the text says, but not have the presence of God is what? It's a disaster. It's an utter disaster. Israel gets it. <laughs> For once, Israel has it right. Question is, do you? Do I? Right? If we drew a line in the sand and on one hand you could have every earthly benefit and pleasure imaginable. So just start to populate that list. Perfect health, a perfect marriage, perfect family, a perfect job, perfect savings account, a perfect retirement, perfect relationships with all your friends, a perfect church, a state, and a nation whose politics align perfectly with your own, and just the perfect amount of sunny days and rainy days and snowy days, all tailor-made to your liking. It's on one side, and on the other side, you have God and his presence. Which would you choose? If you could have heaven on earth, but God is absent, or hell on earth, right? An earthly existence, which is just one long walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but God is with you. Which would you choose? Israel gets it. Israel gets it. In fact, look at the way that Moses puts it in verse 15. Moses says, if your presence will not go with me, don't even bring us up from here. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, leave us in the wilderness. Right? Don't bring us into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. If your presence will not go with us, better to stay as nomads in the desert. Church, do you believe that? Better to be in the desert but near God than to be in paradise without God. And this is the threat that is being made. How does the nation respond? Verse 4, we read, So no one put on his ornaments. That word ornaments speaks of jewelry, right? Valuable necklaces, rings. This is amplified in verse 6. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onwards. Two things we need to see there. First, we need to notice the parallelism between what Israel does here and what Israel did in their rebellion in Exodus 32. So in Exodus 32, verse 8, we read, right? So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears. Now the verb there for take off is actually much 
more forceful than is translated there. A better translation of that verb, to take off, is probably tore off or snatched off. So what we have in that verse is a violence, right, to that action. That's exactly what we read in verse 6 of chapter 33. The people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments. This is an act of contrition. And the point here is that the violence of their previous idolatry is being matched by the violence of their present repentance. That's the first thing we need to see. The second thing we need to see is that they keep their ornaments or their jewelry off their persons from Mount Horeb onwards, which means they remain, at least visually, in a state of mourning over their sin and over this threat, not for a day, right? How many of you have either experienced or perhaps seen, you know, regret or mourning over sin that lasts maybe 10 hours, 12 hours? No, no, no. It's not for a day, it's not for a week, not for a month, month, but from the point they leave Mount Horeb onwards, they no longer wear their jewelry as a sign of their mourning over their sin. That's how they respond. So that is the threat of God's presence withheld. Second point, we see God's presence distanced. God's presence distanced. In verses 7 through 11, we have what seems to be an interlude of sorts, right? So we read in verse 7 that Moses sets up a tent outside the camp that is to function as a tent of meeting, right? A place where Yahweh and Moses would meet. And whatever Moses would go into the tent, verse 9, right, the pillar of cloud, which had been leading the people of Israel, would descend, symbolizing Yahweh's presence with Moses, and it would stand at the entrance of the tent. And Yahweh would communicate and commune with Moses there. And it seems at first glance like verses 7 through 11 are a little bit out of place. But here we need to actually remember the context. Okay? So if you've been coming to church over the summer, right, what did Westcott preach on from the book of Exodus? He preached on the construction of the tabernacle. You remember? What's the point of the tabernacle? The tabernacle was the way by which Yahweh would do what? Dwell in the midst of his people, right? So Exodus 25, verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell in their midst. Or Exodus 29, verse 45, I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God. I will be with them. I will dwell in their midst. I will dwell among them. And then we read in Exodus 33, verse 7, that Moses pitched a tent of meeting where? Outside the camp. Far off from the camp. And everyone who sought Yahweh would have to go out of his tent, and they would have to go to the tent of meeting, which was where? Outside the camp. So why, we have to ask ourselves the question of why is this notion of being outside and away from the camp repeated three times? It's to show that God is not dwelling among his people. He's not dwelling with them. Why? Because their idolatry and sin had caused God to put distance between them. That's the whole point of this. We see this pattern throughout the Bible, don't we? Think about Adam and Eve. When they sin, they are kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And what was the garden? The garden was the place where God used to walk with and commune with them removed from his presence. Or think about the nation of Israel, right? Eventually, because of their idolatry, they're going to be kicked out of where? Kicked out of the promised land, right? That land where God said he would uniquely make his presence to dwell. So here we have the same image. And so it is true in our lives as well, church. 
our idolatry, our sin causes there to be a breach, a division between us and God's presence, which begs the question this morning, is there sin in your life? Perhaps a one-time sin, perhaps a pattern of sin that right now you are refusing to repent of. If that's true, you need to understand that your sin puts a breach between you and God. The God who is the source of all life, right? The God who is the source of all hope. The God who is the source of all joy. Your unrepentant sin puts distance between you and that God. Perhaps you've come here this morning and you don't feel spiritually vital. You don't feel at peace. And you don't have any hope or any joy. And you have looked to other people as the cause of those things. Or you have looked to your circumstances as the cause of those things. And you have failed to look in the mirror. My exhortation to you this morning is simple. Perhaps you should start by looking in the mirror to see if there is unrepentant sin in your life, undealt with sin in your life that has put distance between you and the God that we are talking about. Now, that's not always the case, but it's important to start there. That is God's presence distanced. This leads to our third point, God's presence demanded. God's presence demanded. In a section we just looked at, we saw how Yahweh had distanced himself from Israel because of their idolatry. But there's a contrast in those verses, right? Who remains close to Yahweh in those verses? Ryan talked about it. It's Moses, right? Moses speaks to Yahweh face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And so what we see in the next section is what Moses is going to do with his position of favor, right? How is Moses going to use that position of favor? And just like we saw last week, we're going to see this week that Moses is going to leverage it, not for his own good, but for the good of his people. Because Moses is the mediator that Israel needs. Verse 12, Moses says to Yahweh, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Now, when we read that, we need to realize that on one hand, this is kind of not true because God did say who he was going to send with Moses. Do you remember? He says in 33 verse 2, I will send an angel before you. Guess what? Moses doesn't like that answer. <laughs> Right? He doesn't want an angel of God to go before him. No, he wants God himself to go with him. And so Moses continues to press. Verse 12, yet you have said, I know you, Moses, by name, and you, Moses, have also found favor in my sight. Verse 13, now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight... Please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight and consider too that this nation is your people. What is Moses doing here? He is saying to God, prove it. <laughs> he, he says, you have said that I have found favor in your eyes. If that's true, God, prove it. How? By doing two things. One, show me your ways, or as he says later, show me your glory. And two, consider or remember that this nation is your people. See, pronouns matter. No pun intended. Yahweh responds, verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. There's the key, right? It's not, I will send my angel before you, but what? My presence will go with you, 
and I myself will give you rest in the land of promise. And really, the conversation should have ended there, right? Yahweh has promised his presence that he is going to lead Moses and the people into the promised land. But notice what Moses does. He wants something more. He wants a sign from God. What's the sign that he wants? He wants to see God's glory. Verse 16. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Just pause here. All right? Think about what Yahweh was going to do for the people of Israel. Yahweh had already said, I'm going to send an angel, my angel before you. That angel is going to safely deliver you into the promised land. That angel is going to drive out all of the nations inhabiting the promised land. And you're going to be settled into the land flowing with milk and honey. But what does Moses assert right there? Moses asserts that it is not their occupation of the promised land that sets them apart. And it is not that they will have success in battle against these other nations that sets them apart. And it is not their impending material abundance in the land that sets them apart. What sets apart Moses and the people of Israel? What distinguishes them from every other nation on planet Earth? That Yahweh is with them. It is God's covenant presence that sets them apart. Let's, friends, in the midst of suffering, if you are suffering this morning, this is what we cling to, right? In the midst of a loss of health, in the midst of financial struggles, in the midst of a difficult work situation, in the midst of friends and family members who want nothing to do with you because of your faith, in the midst of a society where our beliefs have made us anathema, what sets us apart as the people of God? Is it that we are always successful? Is it that we always occupy the positions and the places of power and influence? Is it that we have great material abundance? Is it that we are prosperous in an earthly sense? Church, what sets us apart from the rest of the world is that the God of the universe is with us. And he is with us not because of our righteousness. He is with us not because of our morality. He is with us not because we are better than the society around us. He is with us because we have been purchased by the infinitely valuable blood of the Lamb of God. He's with us because we have been sealed by His Holy Spirit. As Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 so gloriously says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? There's this song by Keith and Kristen Getty that we love to sing called When Trials Come. Here's how that song starts. When trials come, no longer fear, for in the pain our God draws near. That's what sets the people of God apart, that God has drawn near to them. You believe that? This is why Moses demanded God's presence because it made all the difference in the universe. And this sets up our fourth point this morning, God's presence restored. All right, Moses is pressing and pressing and pressing. He is saying to God, give me a sign that your presence will go with us. Give me a sign that you have once again restored your favor, not just upon me, but upon your people. And finally, Yahweh gives in. In verse 14, we read this. This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. I will do. 
for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. God is going to show Moses his glory as a confirming sign that his presence will go with him. And this unfolds in the rest of 33 and in the beginning of Exodus 34. Now, let me give you a brief side note, okay? So I want to let you know this morning I'm calling a little bit of an audible, okay? Now, I'm making the argument, and I believe our text supports this argument, that the driving force of this passage of Scripture is the presence of God. And God's exposition of his name in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 34 are just part of the greater context where God is confirming to Moses, my presence will go with you and the people. And I think the, one of the biggest pieces of evidence for this is that at the end of verse 9, right, God has just proclaimed his name to Moses and he's caused his glory to pass before Moses and Moses bows down in worship and then how does Moses respond in verse 9? What does he say? Back to that same old phrase. If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. Right? He is obsessed with God's presence. So that's the, that's the whole point of God's name being revealed, to confirm his presence with his people. But I would be foolish not to take time to walk through those two verses in detail because they are an absolute treasure chest. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not really going to talk about those this morning. I'm just going to briefly walk through our final point. But then next week, if you come back, I'm going to double-click on those two verses. And we're going to just take as much time as we need to savor them. And they will be the perfect lead-in to celebrating communion, right? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And I already told Westcott, so I got his approval. <laughs> right, back to our, our text. God finally gives in, right? He's, he's going to show Moses his ways. He's going to show Moses his glory to confirm, yes, my, prom my presence will go with you. But notice how many stipulations he gives in showing Moses his glory. Right? Moses has asked to see God's glory, but we read that Moses cannot see his face. Now, of course, we know that because God is spirit, he does not have a literal face. So what does he mean? Well, he means rather that Moses cannot see his full unmitigated, undiluted radiance, right? If he saw that, guess what would happen to Moses? He would die instantly. So God must protect Moses from himself. And to do that, he sets up all of these guardrails. Verse 19, first, he says that he will make his goodness do what? Pass before Moses. We might just walk past that, but notice what he says. He's not going to station his glory before Moses so that Moses can take in as much of it as he wants. He's just going to make it pass by. It's just like a parade. It's just going to pass by. You're only going to catch a glimpse of it. Second, verse 22, he says that when his glory does pass by Moses, he's going to have to put him where? In a cleft of a rock. Right? Literally, it was probably a cave in the mountainside. Right? So Moses is not going to be standing out in the open. He's going to be put in a cave so that his vision is obscured. That's the second guardrail. The third guardrail is he says not only that, that when his glory passes, he's going to cover the opening of that cave with his hand. Now again, it's not a literal hand because God is spirit. What, what is being said here is that God is going to obscure Moses' vision even more, covering the mouth of the cave so that when God passes, Moses can't peek out. Why? Fourth guardrail, verse 23. Because Moses can only see the back of God's glory, 
right? It's not until Yahweh has fully passed by and only then will Yahweh take his hand away so that Moses can see not, not the front of God's glory, but as it were, the back of God's glory. That's it. That's all that Moses' finite, limited, sinful eyes can take. The back of God's glory viewed from a cave as it passes by him. I've, sur- I've heard some preachers refer to this as the afterglow of God's glory. Now, just consider that for a moment. In terms of holiness... You don't get much more holy than Moses, right? This is the man with whom God would speak as it were, it's a figure of speech, face to face as a man speaks with his friend, and yet he, even he, can only behold a smidgen of God's glory and survive. Now, you know what should blow our minds about this? That we have beheld an even greater measure of God's glory. You're like, really? (laughs) Yeah. Church, we have beheld a greater measure of God's glory than even Moses. You don't believe me? Let me give you a text, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Friends, on this side of Calvary, guess how God has chosen to manifest, to encapsulate his mind-boggling, worship-inducing, awe-inspiring glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus? Have you met Jesus? If so, you have beheld more of God's glory than Moses could have ever imagined. In the face of our dear Savior and Lord, we have beheld a measure of God's glory that Moses could only ever dream of. And it is this revelation of God's glory that affirms His promise to Moses, right? My presence will go with you, and I will give you and my people rest. And how does he confirm it? Shows Moses his glory. Now we're going to dig into that more next Sunday, but I want you to see one other thing. One other piece of evidence that God has restored his presence with his people. Look at verse 1. What does God tell Moses to do? Verse 1, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. We saw last Sunday that in Exodus 32, when Moses came down from the mountain and he saw the people engage in all sorts of idolatry, what did he do? He broke the tablets of stone. And he didn't just break them because he was righteously angry. He breaks those things as a vivid symbol that the relationship between Yahweh and his people had also been broken. Right? So the breaking of the terms of the covenant symbolized that the covenant itself had been broken. And here, what does Yahweh tell Moses to do? Make two tablets that are exactly the same. Bring them up. And we will write on them the exact same terms of the exact same covenant. And that which was once broken will be restored. The covenant will be renewed. And the covenant having been renewed, I, Yahweh, will once again dwell with my people. And look at what Yahweh says down in Exodus 34, 11. 
Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. I, not an angel, will be with you and will lay, lead you safely into the promised land. This is God's presence restored with his people. Church, from beginning to end, this entire passage is about God's presence. Without God's presence, Moses was a no one. Without God's presence, Israel was nothing. Without God's presence, the defeat of Israel's enemies was meaningless. Without God's presence, the promised land itself would have been a house of horrors. But with it, friends, it means everything. So here's the question for us, church. Do we believe that? That God is present in your cancer diagnosis, and that means everything. That God is present in the absence of your spouse, and that means everything. That God is present when all your plans utterly fail, and that means everything. That God is present in your broken marriage, and that means everything. That God is present in your divided household, and that means everything. That God is present in your impossible work situation, and that means everything. That God is present in your abandonment, and those who claim to love you most have just left you, and that means everything. That God is present in your overwhelming shame and guilt, and that means everything. That God is present in the stark unknowns of your future. And that means everything. That God is present in your sleepless nights. And that means everything. That God is present in your unrelenting physical pain. And that means everything. That God is present in your paralyzing loneliness. And that means everything everything. Church, we love to sing the words of this beloved hymn, but I ask you this morning, do you believe them? Or do you, do I? I abide with me. I, I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still when if thou abide with me. If God is with us, we triumph in life and in death, in sickness and in health, in poverty and in wealth, in joy and in sorrow, in laughter and in tears. Why? Because God is with us. And beyond that, church, we have this glorious, hope-giving promise. We know how the story ends, right? And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Church, God is with us, and God will be what? with us for all eternity, and that makes all the difference in the world. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we praise you that because of what Christ has done, he has secured your presence with us for all eternity. Father, I know that there are some this morning who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh God, I pray that you would remind them that you are with them. God, there are some this morning who right now feel great and hopeful and joyous, 
But in the coming days and weeks and months, they will begin to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Pray that you would remind them that you are with them. Oh God, whatever we face, I pray that we would cling to, that we would crave your covenant presence with us and that we would rejoice in the promise that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will be with us even to the end of the age. And we pray this in Christ's name for his glory. Amen.